Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Friend Show. Hope it will be quite insightful and exciting episode for your entertainment and intellectual nourishment. Uh, I'm your host, Nicola Farmer, and I'm joined today by two of my colleagues from the IRR, uh, Mr. Gabriel Krauser. Gabriel, how are you? Good, Nick. Thank you. How's it? And uh, Mr. Marius Root, the son of the son of the soil, the avatar of the people, the son of the East Rand. How are you, Marius? The line of baloney. How's it, guys? <laughs> line of baloney. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so All let's right. start off with yeah, yeah. Sure, go ahead, Kevin. No, 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 no. He's our homie from Benoni. <laughs> we um, so we're going to start off with some news about us, uh, us being the Institute of Race Relations which is, of course, the parent organization of The Daily Friend. And um, that is that our CEO and glorious leader, as we have occasionally referred to him, Franz Cronier, will be stepping down as CEO of the Institute at the end of this year. He's worked for the Institute for 18 years, and he's been its CEO for eight years. Um, it's prospered a lot while, while he's been here. Um, Gabriel and I both joined the Institute while Franz was the, the CEO. Uh, there is a replacement yet to be selected, That'll go on through the through the year, um, and in the meantime, France is going to uh, prepare to hand over to someone else. So exciting times for us. Also a bit sad because, of course, we we think that France is great. Um, Marius, you've known France a very long time. Tell us what you think about this. Yeah, I've actually uh, uh, France and I have a mutual friend, a guy that uh, I became friends with when I was a, a waiter and as a student who'd been in school in France. So I've known met France about eighteen years ago for the first time. Uh, just a couple of times, but I've worked on with them on and off for about eight or nine years. And yeah, it's it's a big loss for the Institute. Uh, France has been a great leader for the organization. And, and I think he's done a lot to uh, fight back against the, uh, you know, bad policy and bad laws in South Africa. And I think he's uh, got a good team together. And yeah, I think uh, he's going to leave a good legacy for the Institute. And I think it's a big loss for the organization. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it probably feels it's time to move on. And uh Obviously, going to wish him all the best, but we just luckily still got a almost all year with him, so we're still going to be seeing quite a lot of him, I think. Right, and he will actually be on the show tomorrow um, to continue our discussion from last week Wednesday. Uh, Gabriel, you, I believe, were actually a tenant of France at one point. Um, is that right? It is. Yes. When I first came to work for the Institute of Race Relations, I was sort of stuck in between a move, and he said, "Why don't you come live in my cottage for a month?" Uh, and it was really. Um, daunting prospect i said to some of my friends my my boss is offering for me to live <laughs> in his cottage for a month i've only started working here i started as like a, a contract basis you know for a couple of projects and i just become a permanent employee um it was a wonderful experience uh what a way to to get to know a great man um outside of the office environment uh which is a lot like inside the office environment. I think one of the attributes of France, uh, both as a manager and a chief executive, as well as a political player in this country, is his human warmth, uh, mm -hmm. is his presence. You know, I think sometimes at the Institute, we deal with people who are full of ideas and it's their own idea and they've got a dogma and they're gonna stick to it. And they, and they sometimes miss the moment. Uh, they, 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 they miss what is being said to them because uh, they're trying to filter it through a lens. Now, France is definitely a man of principle, uh, and those principles are firm, and they've been tested in the hardest ways. I think one of the stories we we, we were told and we like to tell is when one of our uh, large donors uh, oh. said that they... The yeah, back when we had many large donors said, look, you guys need to give a, a BEE certificate to us in order for us to refinance you. And and if we had, we would have passed with flying colors. Uh, but we oppose BEE. And so we said we're not going to do that because it would make hypocrites out of us. Uh, and, and of course, Gwen and Gwenya was working at the time for the Institute. And she, was, and she insisted on writing the refusal letter. And yeah, we lost a lot of money as a result of that. And we hung that rejection letter up on the wall uh, as a reminder to and as a lesson to new people like me that we walk the walk here. So France really walks the walk. He's very serious, he's very principled, but at the same time, he's very funny, he's very charming, and he's a very good listener. 
uh, I think because of that human warmth that I was talking about, uh, which has been great for steering the team. And uh, yeah, I don't even want to think about missing him uh, yeah. as part of the Institute, but I'm sure he'll, you know, I, I think he, he, he's always going to be part of the cause, part of the mission. Uh, Matt, Matt is I, I, so I haven't known him as long as you guys have, but I will always remember the interview he, uh, he gave me when I, when I first got employed for the Institute and um, it was, shall we say, quite a nerve wracking interview, but a very good one. <laughs> Uh, and I also, um, I must say the first time I ever saw one of his strategic intelligence briefings where he lays out the Institute's, uh, view of the country, um, with all the graphs and stats and things, uh, I was really blown away. I thought it was fantastic. I, I still do. Um, and we've been, of course, updating it, uh, to inform a lot of our analysis. So that's some really good stuff. So we're definitely going to miss him. Um, but he's built some very strong structures and institutions here. So we are. Uh, yeah, can I say one last thing about that? Hmm. I was just saying, Nicholas and I were just discussing yesterday on Two Crickets and a Thorn Tree that a uh, line by Stephen Covey, the most successful sort of self help, business help uh, writer, I think, by many measures, Seven Habits for Highly Successful People. Child writes Seven Habits for Highly Successful Teens and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, our old headmaster at school really loved this and as a teenager impressed me with this line, which I'll never forget, which is that uh, a, a really good leader gets the bus going in the right direction. But a great leader gets it going so that even if that leader is knocked out of the bus or leaves the bus for whatever reason, it still goes in the right direction. It's, it's, so, it's so the opposite of Machiavelli. Machiavelli's lesson for the tyrant was a prince will have absolute power if his people cannot imagine living on without him. And we know that kind of leadership all too well. This is exactly what the ANC has installed in this country. It is impossible to imagine an ANC that people approve of with Artsil Ramaphosa at the head of it. Hmm. This, is not, this is not good or great leadership. Great leadership is making yourself able to step away and for the thing to keep going. Because you haven't clutched, you haven't in a paranoid fashion oppressed and twisted and, and made everything about yourself and and i think that sort of humility in leadership is uh it's remarkable whenever it happens and it's been one of the privileges and honors of my life to to work uh under such to serve such a leader right no i agree completely and speaking of uh good leaders let's turn now to some bad leaders and that is uh of course the events surrounding the zondo commission uh, with President Jacob Zuma, we we I think the last time we talked about this uh, event on the show, Zuma had just been defeated in the Constitutional Court, and we said he has no more sort of legal options really to kind of uh, get out of going to the Zonda Commission. Well, it seems that uh, Zuma agreed because, of course, he then uh, refused to show up, um, which has been somewhat awkward for the rule of law in the country. Now. I think, I think it was Gareth von Onsen may have pointed out today, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on Twitter, uh, that Ramaphosa has been fairly soft on Zuma, despite the fact that he appears to be um, defying a constitutional court ruling. Uh, von Onsen claimed that, they, that it's very difficult to find any evidence that Ramaphosa has actually ever criticized the moral conduct of Zuma in public, um, which is quite an interesting thought. I don't know if you two uh, know of an example that proves that wrong, but it's, I think, still somewhat worrying to think about. Uh, when Robert Pauza was asked his, about his response to Zuma defying the Constitutional Court, he said, I think we should give him more time to consider, but no one is putting arresting him on the table. That's just not, not a thing we should do. Um, there's now an attempt, I believe, by J Judge Zondo to have a application to have um, Zuma declared in contempt of court which presumably would force the prosecuting authorities to arrest him, although I don't know. So I don't know how much there is to say about this, so we're probably not going to linger on it too long, but Maris, some quick thoughts on this. Well, uh, if Jacob Zuma doesn't, if he doesn't face some punishment for you know, ignoring a court order, then I think it uh, has some serious implications for South Africa. I mean, a principle of any democracy or uh, you know, any country that where where people should be treated equally is that there should be the rule of law. And if Jacob Zuma can ignore a court order, that's quite a serious implication. And if the ANC or the prosecuting authorities, whatever it is, they decide not to 
uh, you know, enforce it. I mean, that's also a problem in itself that I'm saying the NC decides not to enforce it. The NC should not be deciding at all, but I think that's kind of the problem. The NC will come and say, so-and-so needs to step down because they've faced some corruption charges or they should face corruption charges from the NPA or whatever the case it is. Yeah, so I think this is some serious problem for South Africa, but also um, I'd be like, I don't know how popular Jacob Zuma is. We've seen the serious people who, I mean, people who've come forward to support him are people that nobody takes seriously in the country. It's people like Colin Nias, Kebi Mapatswe, his sons like Edward Zuma, people that nobody takes seriously in South Africa. So I'm not sure how, how much support he does have, actually. So let me let me go oh. to 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 uh, Gabriel on that point, right? So Carl Lee House specifically, who is a spokesperson for the Mkonto Sizwe Veterans Association, um, said that uh, any effort to see Mr. Zuma in jail would cause instability in the country, and that the matter at hand needs cooler heads. Um, and then he went on to claim that Judge Zondo has a personal beef with Mr. Zuma, uh, which is why Zuma is saying that he can't uh, appear before the the, the commission because he says that it's a uh, it's biased against him, which is strange because I believe he instituted it. Anyway, um, Gabriel, uh, as for Marius's point and and Carl Niehaus's threats, do you think there's any real chance of instability in the nation if uh, Zuma is arrested? Yeah, things are liquid, so it's hard to say. But in 2017, ENCA, Mark Data, and R. W. Johnson uh, collectively did some of the largest polling that's ever been done in the country around this question, and Support for Zuma going to jail was like sort of half and half, if I remember correctly. There are a lot of people, the, the majority really wanted Zuma out of power, uh, but seemed happy for him to go and sit down quietly at Nkandla by himself. I think that there is a hard core of the country, uh, reflected in that poll around 20, maybe even 30%, uh, Dlamini Zuma rights, Zuma rights, um, and one of the things R.W. Johnson insists on talking about uh, and, and criticizes the mainstream media for, for shirking is the tribal nature of this affiliation. Uh, Zuma's great victory for the ANC, of course, was to in, uh, fold in uh, Zulu nationalism into the ANC's uh, okay. umbrella, which uh, previously had just been held by the IFP. And I think that there is a serious faction there. I think that uh, if you look... Uh, at uh, Zuma's fall from grace and his return to power and the ways in which that depended on taxi kingpin networks in KZN, uh, who both had power and muscle. I think that's very important. I think it's uh, important not to push too harshly against Ramaphosa. I mean, I think that he's doing a lot of things wrong right now. For him to try and keep distance between himself and the charges is the kind of thing that if the president were otherwise performing well, I think we might celebrate. Uh, we might say he's learned the lesson from Thabo Mbeki, whose involvement, of course, with Bulalani and Luka was part of the reason that Zuma managed to get this narrative going, that he's not really guilty of corruption, or even if he is, it doesn't matter because he's a victim of uh, faction politics within the ANC. So I think trying to keep distance from it uh, in theory is okay, if the National Prosecuting Authority then moves speedily to uh, hit the nail on the head, which, as you guys has said, means upholding the rule of law. The Constitutional Court has said he must appear. That is the highest court in the land. There's no question he must appear. And that means he should be dragged, as humiliating as it is, with handcuffs around his wrists and ankles, if need be, through very heavily armored convoys, if need be, to protect against any vigilante violence. Uh, it's just a, it's just a must. And the longer you delay and the longer you drag your feet, the more time you give. We have this terrible habit in South Africa of pretending that the good guys are the only people with time on their hands. The long-term strategists are the only people with time in their hands. You also give more time for Zuma and his cronies to figure out how best to disrupt the system uh, by hook or by crook. Uh, so I think uh, urgency, right. time is of the essence, as Shakespeare might say. Indeed. There was um, just to uh, mention an incident in the 90s. Uh, Nelson Mandela, when he was president, was summoned by Louis Leite. I can't remember the uh, details of the case, but he was summoned to court by Louis Leite. And uh, Mandela's lawyers at the time thought it was a frivolous summons, but Nelson Mandela decided uh, to prove that the, the rule of law in South Africa, and nobody, including the president, the sitting president of the Republic, is not above the law. He agreed to the, uh, answer that summons and appeared in court. And I think, uh, you know, we um, that that was, I think Nelson Mandela, his legacy is actually 
mixed if we look back on it, but I think he did do a lot of right, things right. And one of those was showing that the rule of law is it's a fundamental cornerstone of any uh, democracy. And that's one thing. If we tamper with it now, we could be setting ourselves up for lots of pain in the future. And if we, if Jacob Zuma doesn't appear at the Zondo Commission, it's going to be, yeah, it could have serious implications for South Africa's future and the rule of law in this country. Right. With that in mind, uh, let us move on to one of the other great issues plaguing the nation, and that is, of course, our friend ESCOM. Um, so the ESCOM CEO, Andre Dureta, appeared on uh, a, a discussion, or a, I think it was a podcast, the Free Marketeers podcast, hosted by the Free Market Foundation, um, our friends there. So do check that out if, you, uh, if you're if you interested. Um, and he said several things uh, in that interview with the Free Market Foundation, which were quite interesting. One of them was that he discussed, he said that ESCOM had indeed um, shed 2,000 jobs in the past year. Now, this was a, a point when we've talked about ESCOM more in depth. We've said that it's a pretty good idea that, for them to downsize. Uh, he says that they still need to go from 44,000 employees uh, to 38,000. Um, so they've still got another sort of 6,000 employees that he believes need to go. However, these employees weren't um, fired. They were shed through a process of what he called natural attrition, such as retirement and voluntary severance packages. Uh, he also went on to talk about uh, the. He said that the managers were getting uh, that that there was a myth that managers were getting bonuses and pay increases, which he said was untrue. Um, he said that they weren't performing well in procurement, but it was a focus area for them to sort that out. Um, he said that they have been pushing their power stations too hard. Uh, which has resulted in many break, breakdowns. He says that currently they're going through a lot of maintenance, which he believes will reduce the amount of load shedding significantly by September. Uh, he also talked about um, how it was important that ESCOM does increase it, the electricity price because it's so enormously in debt, but he believed that a sudden increase would be bad and that he wants to do this in a phased approach. So, Gabriel, you've looked into ESCOM a little bit. Um, what do you make of what the CEO is saying here? Should we take it seriously? Is ESCOM being turned around? Yeah, I had a friend who used to work at ESCOM, and uh, his, he, well, I asked him, what do you do? He said, root cause analysis. This is unfortunately what uh, Dorator is not doing. So look at procurement. What is the root cause analysis there? If you want to know, go read Gwen and Gwenya, Politics Web, I think the thing is called uh, thinking BE is not part of Eskom's woes, uh, is an eclipse of the brain, a brain eclipse. Uh, the procurement abuses there have happened directly, explicitly as a result of uh, the BE fig leaf uh, behind which corruption lies. Now, Dereta doesn't have the cojones or the proverbials, <clears throat> sorry, to say that. And so he's sort of uh, boxing with one hand tied behind his arm. The second point is Jabu Mabuza, who was the chairman of the ESCOM board uh, in the latter part of the Zuma era, said 33% of ESCOM staff is redundant. So this is not a new idea, firstly. Secondly, Dorate has reduced that from 33% to 18%. Thirdly, uh, he's going about the thing in the wrong way. You don't... You don't get rid of redundant staff by saying, hey, guys, who wants to go find another job? Who has really good skills and good work ethic and good credentials and can go and find another job like my old friend who went to work for a fabulous company in Sweden? You guys can go and we'll even pay you to leave. And, and who of you really wants to stay because you've got no other option? Okay, we'll continue paying you because you're just setting it up in such a way that you, you're going to get rid of the most useful people. I mean, I'm not saying everyone who's going was perfectly useful and that everyone who's staying is perfectly useless. But the, but the percentages, you, you're getting the most concentrated useful le leaving and the most concentrated useless remainder. So he's shadow boxing with two hands tied behind his back. Um, I want to just flag this by saying I have some American friends because I lived there for six years uh, who, who were saying to me how terrible it was. Oh, my Lord, going on on Facebook had no power in Houston, Texas, because there's, you know, some wind blowing all the way from the North Pole that's made it go minus 20 degrees there. And that sort of got in the way of some power production and everyone turned their heaters up to max and that created a problem. So they did a bit of load shedding. Oh, eight hours without electricity. Update, 10 hours with electricity. 
feeling very sorry for themselves. Every newspaper in the country headlining it, every television channel in the country getting their people there with the cameras to look at what it's like to have to do your homework by candlelight. For one day, it is a dramatic, it is a social trauma to have no electricity for one day. And remember that it is a trauma that we have so many times that we, oh, we, we've become numb. We've become numb right. to a very terrifying thing. I remember and, once having and, you, and we're not going to change it with both hands tied behind our back. Agreed. Uh, I remember once having a 72 hour uh, approximately uh, outage when my local substation blew up. Anyway, fun times. Uh, Marius, uh, do you have anything to add to what, what Gabriel said there? Any, any, any further thoughts on this? No, I do think I feel sorry for underrated. Probably being the CEO of ESCOM is, along with being the captain of protests, two of the shittest jobs in South Africa at the moment. So, but I do think uh, he does see somebody who's trying to do the right thing, but like Gabriel says, there's some political considerations which are uh, hobbling him a bit. But I do think, I mean, he's trying to make the best of a bad situation. And yeah, let's hope he can turn things around. But uh, yeah, I think, as I say, political issues might be what's preventing him. And who knows, he might have just been handed such a, you know, hospital pass that no matter what he does, he won't be able to turn things around. But he does seem to have the, you know, he does seem to be trying to do what he can. But you know, let's hope uh, by September, which also um, my birthday's in that month. So hopefully I'll get a nice birthday present and no load shedding for South Africa in September. But I'm not hopeful, and I think it's mainly for the reasons that uh, Gabriel pointed out. So, but I mean, if, if maintenance is being done as the rates are saying uh, it is being, then yeah, maybe, you know, maybe we'll we'll be surprised and we'll get some positive news out of ESCOM for change. Yeah, you know, the nice yeah, thing I, about birthdays is you've got candles on the cake, Mario. So we'll already be able to. <laughs> and I'll have a light because I'm turning 42, so I'll probably have to light the whole room. I, I think there's a little bit of a, a contradiction when he says, uh, he talks about how, on average, he says that uh, ESCOM power stations are 39 years old, um, which is, you know, pretty old. Uh, and, of course, a lot of the problems we've seen have been actually at the newer power stations as well. Um, mm. Dupi and Kassile keep having issues. Um, so it's not... Uh, I, I think that uh, more maintenance is not necessarily going to turn us around. So we will revisit this towards the end of the year and see what the load shedding situation is. Um, uh, we'll keep an eye on that, but uh, I think it is going to be a very uh, important thing to test. He has used also slightly vague words here and saying that we should see, quote, a substantial reduction in the risk of load shedding. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. So <laughs> we'll, you can hope we'll, we'll like see. Marius. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> yes. Just so, don't so turn the lights can... on. Well, what did Nick told me once, only the man who uh, only a man who has no hope can feel despair. I mean, only a man right. who still has hope can feel despair. So once, that's, once, uh, if you, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> from, a line uh, from uh, The Dark Knight Rises. Um, exactly. Phil and Bain says that. I think it's quite true, actually. Anyway, let us move on uh, to the UK. And this is a story from <laughs> that great institution of newspaper, the Daily Mail, <laughs> um, <laughs> which uh, sometimes produces really great stuff and sometimes does not. But in this case, it's a pretty interesting story that they've got. And this is that uh, Margaret, uh, Margaret Thatcher's old Oxford College, which was Somerville, um, has decided to make all of its students take a, quote, un bi unconscious bias test and warns that uh, there will be serious consequences for any student who does not get 100% uh, mark uh, by the end of the course. Um, uh, the Baroness Royale of Blisden, who's the principal of Summer Somerville College, who is a labor peer, She's 65 years old, um, sent out this order to that everyone must achieve a mark of 100% in the final test. Um, this is in conflict, actually, with the government of the UK, which has said that unconscious bias tests are either counterproductive or not effective at all in rooting out unintentional discrimination, um, and it's completely useless. Uh, during the test, which the Daily Mail claims to have seen, students... Uh, according to them, uh, have to admit that they are susceptible to bias and, quote, need to accept responsibility for monitoring their own behavior. Uh, students are also alleged to be forced to admit to suffering from mini-me syndrome because they automatically favor people like themselves. Um, and in another section, students must concede that a black lecturer would be more likely to be disliked by her students than a white colleague. Anyway, so, Gabriel, 
what should we make of unconscious bias tests? Uh, They're all the rage right now in some parts of the world. Is there any validity that you know of behind the, the sort of psychology and science in them? Yes. So I came across them in Malcolm Gladwell's work. I think it was the one he wrote after Tipping Point over a decade ago. I took such a test myself online that he recommended. He speaks uh, eloquently to the challenge we face where people do have unconscious biases. I think that we at the Institute of Race Relations know that almost better than anyone. We live in the world of debunking myths. The whole reason that people believe in expropriation without compensation, the National Democratic Revolution, national health insurance in this country, uh, sort of promises faking it till you make it working, is 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 because they have unconscious biases. Uh, it's it's very important. Unconscious biases also propped up the Nationalist Party during apartheid for a very long time, and it really is ultimately up to the viewer or the listener to check their own uh, uh, bias. And uh, I try and do that. And I think <clears throat> if I if I said anything else, you shouldn't trust me. That said, uh, what this test is, is a lesson. It's not a test. It tells you what to think. And there are right and wrong answers, which are rubbish. It's just not true. There's strong empirical data coming out of University of Chicago, coming out of Princeton University, coming out of Stanford University, that people are not... Um, uh, disposed to like people like themselves more than the quote unquote other. Uh, in fact, w one of the most famous psychological cases, uh, studies, which I was sort of from 30 years ago, was where school children were grouped arbitrarily. Once on one instance, they were told like all the people with blue eyes on one team, all the people with brown eyes on another team. And after three hours of playing in the sunshine in these two teams, they sort of got to the point where they were willing to rip each other's eyeballs out. It was, it was a sort of alarming, uh, introduction of a bias that hadn't existed heretofore and also very interestingly two weeks later the same students were then studied and it's found that that bias totally went away then if you think well that is looking like me there have been tests done where people are sort of made to team up with those that they don't resemble and and we're just as good at doing that so what people are very good at doing is lumping liking and loathing us versus them we have a natural predilection to doing that and the environment that sort of intellectual environment that surrounds us that sends us signals about who to like and who to dislike who to diss who to praise that uh impresses us in ways that we often don't cognize but that we act out on so the thought that in in uh, oxford university a black lecturer is going to come in and definitely be disliked more than a white lecturer is uh this is old school reification of race. This is saying there's one truth which you don't have to test and it's, it's just true no matter what. If you if you look at the actual experience, I have many friends who went to Oxford, uh, they report exactly the opposite. Um, I certainly had the opposite experience at Princeton. Um, so I think that uh, what, these, what this test is trying to do is really imp imp impress people with a bad idea itself. It is unconsciously biased in short and therefore should be scrapped. I think the Baroness is uh, a, a sort of comic figure um, in, 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 in a sort of intellectual circus. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real pity because Oxford is a very important university. Uh, it's very influential, produces a lot of uh, uh, future members of parliament, future members of the diplomatic corps, future journalists, the kinds of people uh, that uh, set the tone, really. And so impressing them with this kind of unconscious bias through a supposedly unconscious bias test is uh yeah it's it's so funny that uh it's so tragic you've got a laugh right i also find it sort of bizarre that we're being forced to have these views by an aristocrat it's very kind of it just seems sort of all of the time i mean no she's not, no she's not a proper sort of aristocrat but you know she is a peer um uh, she doesn't get to put baroness in front of her name uh, uh maurice your 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 thoughts on this before we close up for today yeah i mean this is pretty much the closest you get to a real life thought police, really, you know, uh, and there was initially, uh, I think you mentioned it, that people, she said that people are going to have disciplinary action taken against them if they didn't score hundred percent. I mean, that's ridiculous. And as Gabriel says, these things, uh, they, they all, they, uh, from what I've read, there's no proof that taking an unconscious bias test actually makes you less racist in any way. Actually, there seems to be evidence that it makes you more racist because it makes you hyper aware of race. So, yeah, I don't know if these things are such a good idea. It seems to be uh, kind of trying to put a, a 
band-aid on a problem which i'm not sure really exists to any the massive degree in a place like the uk but yeah i think it's just uh it's something it's just trying to pander to kind of these uh, uh you know the woke elites maybe if you want to call it that and that's what the baroness is doing but it's glad glad to see there's been some pushback and yeah i mean i think we can all agree that racism is still a problem in parts of the world uh, but i don't think unconscious bias test is what you need to get rid of it uh yeah, so and like I said, I think it's quite scary that it's getting pushed through in so many circles. Right. I should have made it clear at the beginning that the purpose of the unconscious bias te uh, test and uh, course is to expose, according to it, innate racism, homophobia, transphobia, and disability discrimination um, in people who take the course. So it's, you know. Which the Baroness explicitly said, I don't have to defend that it's a problem. I don't have to show you evidence that right. it's a problem. We all just know it's a problem. This is exactly. this is uh, spiritual talk. This is mysticism. Yeah. Right, right, right. Exactly. Anyway, uh, something to be concerned about, but um, I'm, I'm pleased that the, the UK government does actually hold the opposite view at the moment. So uh, hopefully there will... Uh, the, the, this course will be reversed, uh, but we shall see. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we will see you tomorrow on the next episode of The Daily Friend, where Franz Crenier will be back to talk about what comes after the ANC or some potential, potential futures for what comes after the ANC. Anyway, thank you very much for listening and have a good day, everyone.